Welcome back to uh, Verticon. It's the last afternoon of the show, uh, a couple of hours to go before people start packing up and the great fly out begins. Um, I'm here with Johnny Smith, one of our latest um, uh, recruits into the, uh, into the company to, for writing articles. And we're just going to have a quick chat about Airbus's latest product, launched for, uh, formally on Tuesday. Uh, some of us in the industry were very, very fortunate to be taken to Don Alworth, Airbus's headquarters in Germany last week, where we were able to see the prototype of the aircraft and have a greater understanding of, uh, of why the Airbus have, have filled the niche, as it were, between the 135 and the 140. So, Johnny, what, what do you think of thoughts of the aircraft? Uh, it's an impressive piece, isn't it? The first thing that immediately springs to mind to me is the Fenestron tail and the fact that they put the stabiliser up at the top. Absolutely. I mean, Fenestron, it's kind of like a, a, a design mo motif now for Airbus. Uh, lots of good reasons why you don't want to have a tail rotor whizzing around in the open when you've got people working under the back of the aircraft, particularly on uneven terrain. Uh, tail rotors can be quite dangerous on uneven terrain, so uh, safety first, protection, and it also helps a little bit with noise. And the T-tail, those some, some of the viewers may remember the blue copter prototype that Airbus put out a couple of years ago, uh, which had a T-tail. And Airbus have taken that concept, they've, they've, they, they, they are telling us that that T-tail in terms of aerodynamics and lift is, generates about 80 kilograms of extra lift over the conventional tail on the, uh, on the 135. So it, it looks good, but it's actually practical at the same time. And it looks like the whole tail boom's lifted up a bit. Is there some impact on that versus the 135? Yeah, uh, and obviously it's, you're not quite up to, you know, we're both six footers and we're not, we're not going to walk into the back of the aeroplane, but I believe it's about six to eight inches taller than it is on the standard 135. And it's basically anything that makes it easier, uh, you know, we can see we've got the, we've got the patient in there, uh, the sim patient, I hasten to add. Um, you can tell that it's anything that makes it easier to load the stretch of the gurney onto the back of the aircraft from these sort of positions is, is a good thing. And you can also see that unobstructed floor all the way through and plenty of space for stowage and, and medical equipment. So as we're continuing to move forwards then, we've got a little bit of extra engine going on up at the top. Have they put some bigger engines in? Yeah, so it's got some bigger donks in it. Um, the performance figures are, are, are reasonably impressive in terms of over the 135. They're claiming a, uh, about a five, 550 to 600, uh, 450 to 500 pounds, sorry, increase in max gross weight, uh, bigger engines, more power, greater hot and high performance, and a combination of the aero of the fuselage, the aero on the tail and the bigger engines and the five blade rotor system. Uh, they reckon this thing will, will have a V&E of about 155 knots, so about 15 knots faster than a stock H135. Yeah, so we see we've got the, uh, the, the top of the, uh, the controls there all fared in compared to on the, uh, the other helicopter, so that must make it quieter as well. Yeah, so the five-blade rotor makes it quieter, the Fenestron makes it quieter, and I flew the, I flew the five-bladed version of the H145 in, uh, in Germany last week, and it was very, very, it was noticeably smooth. Uh, much smoother than the 135 I, I flew a few years ago, so, and, and relatively quiet. We could have a conversation without the need for headsets if we, if we chose to. So for clinical care in the back of the aircraft, that ability to talk, you know, as we both know, having done, having done medical sorties in, in our military careers, you know, there's no, no hope of talking in the back of our old ride, whereas this, you should be able to hold a relatively normal conversation with the aircraft up and running. And that was absolutely critical. There's a good friend of mine um, called Charlie Thompson, who was one of our uh, medic uh, nurses in Afghanistan, used to say that that communication was, was so critical for patient care, was so difficult in the back of the Chinook because yeah. of the uh, the noise, the vibration, um, and the uh, the helmets and things that people had to uh, had to wear. Absolutely, so, and, and I a think huge the, improvement. And I think the T-tail probably helps you uh, keep a level floor for longer and so for, for a faster speed. So that, that sort of conversation we used to have with the medics, which was fast or slow, rough or smooth, um, you can do a bit of both with this because you've got the space, you've got the quietness, you've got the speed. So this cabin looks fantastic, plenty of space, nice and bright. Nice and bright, yeah, medical lights in the ceiling. Um, Airbus are telling us that they've uh, listened, you know, the, the design philosophy of the H140 was EMS. This was the key customer group that they wanted to design the aeroplane to support. So medical lighting built into the ceiling, plenty of bright light in the back of there for working with the patient. And overall, the, uh, the cabin is one cubic meter bigger than the equivalent 135. And it looks like there's a bit of space going on here for the, uh, in, in the, the front end as well. So I guess we could take this seat out and there's a nice open space in the middle. Yeah, they, they, one of the things that the customers apparently told Airbus they wanted was an unobstructed cabin, the ability to go. And if you remember the 135, 
has a uh, control run pallet that sits behind the seats there, obviously blocking an unobstructed run, whereas I believe what they've done here is they've taken the rerouted flight controls the same way as the 145 and taken them up through the uh, that large column up through the centre of the, uh, the yeah, cockpit yeah. windscreen. So you've got an uninterrupted clean cabin. And plenty of access space through the doors. Yeah, big, nice big doors, uh, nice big windows, and the, the key tell that we used to have, whether it's a 135 or 145, was windows. And if you'll notice here, the 140 now has a window, but obviously this is the door which is open, but you'll notice there's a window behind it there, which used to be a clear tell between a 135 and 145. Well, the 145 had those windows, the 135 didn't. The importance for this is that, okay, it's nice and light, but you can, as you can see here in the EMS fit, you're able to fit stuff in there, use the Alco for kit. But in a future application of this aircraft, perhaps offshore, perhaps supporting super yachts, stuff like that, these, these rear windows are now actually big enough to count as emergency exits, which is a really useful point. And inside the cockpit, you know, Airbus is standard uh, Helionics. Um, I flew the 145 with this setup last week, dual channel FADEC. Uh, it is a ridiculously easy aeroplane to fly um, uh, and very, very stable. Uh, and the engines themselves, twin FADEC, just simple. Everything has redundancy, everything has that graceful degradation of capabilities as systems start to fail, you've still got more and more backup systems to support you. Uh, and a very, as you can see, a very clean ergonomic cockpit. A skidded aircraft, I know some HEMS aircraft have got, uh, got wheels. Skids on this? Yeah, I mean, skids, you, you, skids are helpful for, uh, for some application, particularly if they move to law enforcement where you want to put meek amounts or something similar on the front to get that. That's an opportunity to put in cameras, flares, flotation gear, all that sort of stuff and go on the skids. Uh, I, did, I did believe, I do recall from talking to them last week that perhaps a high skid version may be available in time, but as police helicopters have moved away from having sort of uh, canoes underneath for all their kit, um, the need for high skids is somewhat reduced. Um, a radar nose will be available in, in due course. Um, and, uh, you know, importantly, this aircraft is going to offer about say about 500 pounds extra payload, it will fly 350 odd miles, three hours endurance, it's going to do good things, um, if not more than that. Um, I think it's, they've done their homework and we've seen this week at the show already a significant number of, uh, of early adopters and early orders. And if you get your order in now, first deliveries for EMS helicopters, Airbus are expecting around about 2028. That was absolutely fantastic. And again, fared in, even windscreen wipers fared in, all that focus on trying to keep it quiet, keep it slick. Yeah, all that aero, uh, just to make the aircraft. You know, obviously, what, what Airbus said they were told by their EMS customers was we want something that's cheap to buy, economical to fly, and available. Uh, and um, I said in the article that's available online on our website, I said in some respects, it's a bit of a greatest hits package between the 135 and the 145. Uh, and it's, that's trite, but it's not entirely inaccurate. And it means that the certification process, interestingly, this aircraft will not be certified as an H140. It'll be certified as an H135T4, uh, grandfathering the long established uh, uh, airworthiness certification of the C135, H135. Um, but what it does do is it means that, there's, that they can be confident about those delivery figures because they've got a hotline running. They're already building 135s and 145s at a prodigious rate. Um, and so 2028, I think, is entirely reasonable, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's the, the, first, the, top, the top end of 2028 rather than waiting towards the end. And even here, looking uh, to future interoperability, it's even got USB connectivity and mounts for, uh, for Palm Pilot equipment. Absolutely right. Um, the future's digital, uh, the future's going to be federated, the future is going to be stuff that I can put on an iPad, uh, and change rapidly. It's going to be, a, we're, yeah, we're, we're moving towards an app-based future. If you think of some of the applications that HEMS fly around with now, like ACANS, Mosaic, those things are all driven by, you know, they can be, can be hosted on conventional iPads or, or other, ta other tablets are available um, and, and rapidly reconfigured, reloaded as new apps and refreshed. So you need to have power for that. And looking forward ahead to, um, eventually there'll be an ACH 140 and Airbus, um, uh, a sort of a, uh, a, a very comfortable sort of, co not commercial helicopter, but a uh, uh, sort of a VIP version of it, then corporate helicopter, that's what I was before. So there'll be a, an Airbus corporate helicopter version of it. And that's obviously going to have to have all the bells and whistles for, for the people to be able to enjoy their entertainment while they're whisked around. And hopefully 
a nice, quiet, reliable steed.